Hi friends, today in this lecture we are going to talk about what exactly is pain, right? I think every one of us have experienced this pain in our life. But we should know that what's going on in our bodies when this pain occurs and we should know about what are the mechanisms that happens in our body that actually triggers the pain. And I'm going to talk about those. Also, I'm going to discuss the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. And we should know that why pain is actually important and what does this actually serve for, right? So first, let's talk about what pain is from a medical point of view. See, pain is defined as a localized sensation of discomfort or distress resulting from the stimulation of specialized nerve endings. In other words, we define pain first and foremost as a neurological issue. So now let's look at the neurology of pain. Any sensation of pain begins with the activation of specialized neurons at the site of the injury. Now, as you probably know, we usually divide neurons or nerve cells into three broad types. There are autonomic neurons that take care of the autonomic processes for our bodies like breathing, digestion, heart rate and so on. As well as there are motor neurons that controls your body movements and we have sensory neurons which transmits information from our senses, sight, hearing, touch and all the rest. Pain obviously is a sensory process and this painful stimuli is transmitted by sensory neurons, right? More specifically, pain is transmitted by a subtype of sensory neurons called nociceptors, which comes from the Latin word nosi, that means hurt. It's related to the word noxious, which is why you will sometimes hear pain researchers, they refer to noxious stimuli, right? So those are the stimuli that cause pain. Now let's talk about nociceptors briefly, right? See, nociceptor is a fancy name that is given just to an ending of a sensory neuron. But it is not the name of entire sensory neuron. See, the entire sensory neuron is called as primary afferent sensory neuron. So, nociceptor is a name that is given to only a specific part of a neuron, but the name of that entire neuron is different. This is called primary afferent sensory neuron. And when you look at this neuron, this neuron has a cell body which is located in dorsal root ganglion. And this neuron has two processes or branches or two axons. One is called peripheral process that goes peripherally. And the other one is central process that goes into your spinal cord. At the end of peripheral process, we had a structure called nociceptor. So it is a specialized structure present at the end of peripheral process of primary afferent nociceptive neuron. See, this nociceptor is capable of transducing or converting noxious stimuli or painful stimuli into action potential. And these action potentials, they fire up the peripheral process on to central process and so on. I'm going to talk about in detail how this firing process will go up to the brain, right, later on. There are three major types of nociceptors and we classify these nociceptors based on what noxious stimuli these nociceptors are going to detect. The first type is thermal nociceptors. They sense extreme hot and extreme cold stimuli. The second type is mechanical nociceptors. They detect intense pressure and response to that, followed by the third type of nociceptor is polymodal nociceptors. These nociceptors, they detect all sorts of different noxious stimuli. It means they detect both too hot and too cold, as well as they detect intense pressure, right? There are specific nociceptors or receptors within these specific nociceptors. So receptors for thermal nociceptors are TRP ion channels. TRP refers to transient receptor potential and there are specific TRP ion channels to detect noxious heat as well as noxious cold. So thermal receptors 
or thermal noxy sensors that helps to detect noxious heat they are called trp v1 and trp v2 what is the full form of trp v see the full form of it is transient receptor potential vaniloid these two types are the ion channels that helps to detect noxious heat whereas to detect the noxious cold we have the thermal noxy sensors those are called transient receptor potential menthol 8 which is abbreviated to trpm8 and the second type is trpa1 right so we have the trp receptors that can detect noxious heat and we have the trp receptors that can detect noxious cold and all these trp receptors they are present within the structures that are present at the end of the peripheral processes specifically we call these structures as thermal nociceptors right in case of mechanical nociceptors we have the mechanical noci sensors or mechanical receptors so these mechanical receptors include there are two types one is piezo1 and the other one is piezo2 we also have receptors that can detect chemical noxious stimuli so these receptors are called chemical noxy sensors or chemical receptors and we find these chemical receptors present on polymodal noxy receptors which is the third type right so we see the receptors for atp and protons the receptors for atp are called p2x3 ion channels they belongs to ligand gated ion channels class the receptors for protons are acid sensing ion channels which is abbreviated to asic we find only specific types of acid sensing ion channels in humans like acid sensing ion channel type 1 and acid sensing ion channel type 2 see acid sensing ion channel type 1 and type 2 they both have multiple splice variants like acid sensing ion channel type 1a 1b again acid sensing ion channel type 2a and type 2b right see acid sensing ion channels they also belongs to ligand gated ion channels in fact acid sensing ion channels and p2x receptors they are both grouped together in a large super family of ligand gated ion channels known as p2x like ligand gated ion channels right so this is a super family and within this super family we find these members like acid sensing ion channels and p2x right the next thing is these nociceptors are specialized devices that are present at the end of the peripheral process of a primary afferent nociceptive neuron right see these devices they are attached to primary afferent nociceptive fibers of course right so when you look at those fibers you can notice that some fibers have large diameter some have small diameter some are myelinated some are unmyelinated some fibers conducts the action potential very fast and some conduct very slow so based on these kind of differences like diameter degree of myelination and conduction velocity we classify the fibers into three different types like a beta fibers a delta fibers and the unmyelinated axons which are nothing but c fibers right nociceptors can be found anywhere in the body that includes the skin the muscles bones joints internal organs and the serous membranes those are the protective membranes that surrounds internal organs and nociceptors they are also found in the large intracranial vessels for example the circle of willis see these are like involved in pain in a variety of intracranial processes such as mass lesions right most nociceptors wherever they are found they send this noxious information that's interpreted as pain within higher centers of the nervous system so the job of nociceptor is to detect stimuli a noxious stimuli that are likely to signal possible or actual damage to your body in simpler terms nociceptors are a defense mechanism their basic job is to send a message about an event that's harming your body right so now let's look at how that message travels through the body all the way into your brain right 
we will call this the descending pain modulatory system the dpms for short the nociceptive nerve endings and the nerves that carries the pain signal they are part of the peripheral nervous system and when we talk about the peripheral nervous system we are referring to all of those 100 billion neurons that found outside your brain and spinal cord and these neurons they align into long branching networks of nerve fibers and groups of these interwoven nerve fibers they are called plexuses right and these plexuses eventually lead to the spine which leads to the brain stem and the other major structures of brain to make it more clear let me take transverse section of spinal cord there is mixed spinal nerve it is formed when dorsal root and ventral root combine together you know dorsal root contains axons of neurons which have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion you can see here the swelling part right actually it is a dorsal root ganglion it has cell bodies here and these axons are coming into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord these are called sensory neurons right when nociceptors detect damage Nothing but when nociceptors detect that kind of noxious stimuli, actually it's going to convert this noxious stimuli into action potentials or electrical impulse. And this electrical impulse is carried to the peripheral process of primary nociceptive afferent neuron. This could be made of A beta fibers or A delta fibers or C fibers. And now this peripheral process, it comes into the mixed spinal nerve. You know, this peripheral afferent nociceptive neuron it has its cell body in the dorsal root ganglion right now these electrical impulses through the dorsal root it propagates onto central nociceptive fibers of that same neuron right i said that primary afferent nociceptive neuron has two processes one is peripheral process and the and the other one is central process this central process synapse onto a specialized type of nerve cell called an interneuron which are present in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord so at one end primary afferent nociceptive neuron is detecting the noxious stimuli and carrying these electrical impulses to the other end of this neuron called a central processes and this central process is actually synapsed onto a specialized type of nerve cell within the spinal cord called interneuron right specifically it is present in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord actually these interneurons they connect multiple nerves at the spine and they act like gates controlling which messages get through to the deeper structures of the spine and brain imagine this for a moment you walk into your living room and you bang your leg on the coffee table what happens next like most people almost instinctively you reach down and start rubbing the point of impact and in a few seconds it will start to feel better the thing is what actually happened here we needs to know see remember that the nociceptors are sitting side by side with other sensory neurons the ones that in this case are detecting pressure as well as warmth and when you rub the injured spot the messages from the other sensory neurons overwhelm the messages from the nociceptors and we say that the interneurons they actually open the gates to the comfortable sensations and they close the gates to the painful stimulus this is called the gate control theory of pain and we will see later on it has important implications for pain control. Now let's dive deeper into that bruised leg. For example, you bang your leg against a coffee table. The nociceptors in the area, they send a message through the nearest peripheral nerve towards your spinal cord. And at the spinal cord, specifically in a very special part of your spinal cord called dorsal horn, it encounters that interneuron, that gating cell, and your interneuron decides it's important and it lets the message through. The spine has three important jobs in managing the pain signal. First, it manages your automatic motor responses to pain by sending the appropriate signal 
to the motor neurons near the site of injury. Like when you touch a hot stove, the spine tells you to check your hand away. When you get bitten by a mosquito, the spine makes you sweat at it. Or as in our example, when you bang your leg on the coffee table, the spine makes you halt in your tracks. Right? This is the first thing. The second thing is, what your spine does is, it sorts through all the different signals from your peripheral nervous system and it prioritizes them. That gate control system of interneurons is not just for pain. It's at work in our bodies all the time, sorting and routing all the signals we receive from our sensory nerves. The spine adds chemical modulation to these signals, like it upgrades some signals and it downgrades other signals. Finally, once all that sorting and prioritizing is done, the spine sends the signal onto your brain, right? Now let's continue our story. As I said, interneurons connect multiple nerves at the spine and they act like gates. We have also discussed that the central process carrying electrical impulse, it synapses on one side of interneuron. Now these interneurons on the other side, it synapses onto spinothalamic projection neurons that are on the same side of the body, right? These axons of spinothalamic neurons, they are crossed to the opposite side or contralateral side of the spinal cord. Axons of spinothalamic projection neurons, they are crossed from right dorsal horn to the left anterolateral white matter column. In the same manner, spinothalamic projection neurons in the left dorsal horn, they send their axons across the spinal cord into the right anterolateral white matter column and then it ascends up on the contralateral side and then it goes to the contralateral side of the brain. See these axons that are moving from contralateral white matter columns, they ascend all the way up to thalamus and they move through spinothalamic tracts, right? So sensory information coming from left side of the body goes to the right side of the brain and sensory information coming from right side, the right side of the body, it goes to the left side of the brain. The brain is where pain becomes extraordinarily complex because pain is no longer just a physical phenomenon. The emotional and cognitive centers of the brain get involved as well. So pain is having two components, physical component and emotional component, right? Okay. The pain signal's first stop in the brain is the thalamus. The thalamus consists of two roughly egg-shaped structures, one present in each hemisphere of the brain. And these structures, they sit right above your brain stem. So these two spinothalamic tracts, they come all the way up to the brain stem structures and they go into respective thalami, where left spinothalamic tract from the left anterolateral white matter column will go up to the left side of the brain stem into the left thalamus whereas right spinothalamic tract from the right anterolateral white matter column will go up to right side of the brain stem into the right thalamus. The question is in which specific thalamic nuclei do these axons of these spinothalamic projection neurons actually going into right? See, actually we have two nuclei. One is ventroposterolateral nucleus, which is abbreviated to VPL. And the other nucleus is ventroposteromedial nucleus, which is abbreviated to VPM. Left spinothalamic tracts are coming into left VPM and left VPL nuclei. Right spinothalamic tract, they are coming into right VPM and right VPL nuclei. Now, let me explain you. What are primary neurons, secondary neurons, and tertiary neurons? The neurons that carries the electrical impulses from site of damage to your spinal cord, they are called primary neurons. So these are called primary afferent nociceptive neurons. Whereas the neurons that carry these impulses from the spinal cord to the thalamus, they are called secondary neurons like spinothalamic projection neurons and the neurons that carry impulses from thalamus to primary somatosensory cortex, the hippocampus, 
and the hypothalamus, they are called tertiary neurons. So the secondary neurons of spinothalamic tracts actually synapses on tertiary neurons that are present in ventroposterior lateral nucleus and ventroposterior medial nucleus. And these tertiary neurons, they carry impulses from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory cortex, which is abbreviated to S1, the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. See, thalamus is like a junction box or a switching station where you see routing of sensory input to all the other parts of the brain, specifically to the primary somatosensory cortex, the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. Now, let's look first at the primary somatosensory cortex, which is the physical sensation region, right? The portion of cerebral cortex located just behind the central sulcus or central fissure, this portion of cerebral cortex is known as primary somatosensory cortex or S1. One refers to primary and S refers to somatosensory cortex, right? This somatosensory cortex is a band of neurons in the cerebrum that runs from ear to ear over the top portion of your brain like a head band. And this primary somatosensory cortex, it not only processes your pain signals, but also it processes all the incoming sensory information, right? You know, different areas of primary somatosensory cortex corresponds to different areas of your body. And this tells us the concept map of sensory homunculus. So basically, these tertiary neurons will be projecting to neurons in primary somatosensory cortex on the basis of where actually this information has come from. That means, if the information has come from face, then the tertiary neurons will go more down to the lower portions of primary somatosensory cortex. This tells that the portions that are at top of sensory homunculus, they will process the information coming from lower portions of your body and as you go down to sensory homunculus then these are going to process the information that is coming from the upper portions of the body. This is how our brain knows which portion is injured and also what is type of injury. Is it cutting, burning, stinging or any other type of pain and this makes physical component of pain. As I said, pain has both physical component and emotional component. So this is how we make a physical component of pain. So you are having the tertiary neurons that carries the electrical information from specific part of your body. And if it is from lower portions, then these tertiary neurons, they are going to synapse onto the sensory homunculus that is more present upside, right? If the tertiary neurons, if they are carrying the information from the upper portions of your body, then it will synapse onto the lower portions of sensory homunculus, right? These tertiary neurons, they not only deliver these electrical impulses only to primary somatosensory cortex, but these neurons, they also deliver these electrical impulses to insula cortex and cingulate cortex. Cingulate cortex is a part of limbic system. And when you deliver information to these two different types of cortex, now we form the emotional component of pain. So, where is insular cortex and cingulate cortex exactly located? Now, let's discuss the location of these regions, right? Actually, these are not visible on the surface of your brain. You know, lateral fissure that separates the temporal lobe and frontal lobe. So now what we do is we take a coronal section of brain at the level of lateral fissure. You can see here lateral fissure is invaginating inwards and there is a massive portion of cerebral cortex that is buried deep inside and this is called insula cortex which involves in bad emotions, right? Now let's find cingulate cortex. This time we have to dig at a place that separates two cerebral hemispheres known as longitudinal fissure. This is the sagittal section of 
right side of the brain the portion of cortex above the corpus callosum or outside the corpus callosum we have cingulate cortex so our tertiary neurons they deliver these noxious stimuli or electrical impulses from ventroposterolateral thalamic nucleus and ventroposteromedial thalamic nucleus to primary somatosensory cortex insula cortex cingulate cortex which is a part of limbic system and also it delivers information to the hippocampus region which is also a part of limbic system and also it delivers information to the hypothalamus structures right in a nutshell when we get a specific painful stimulus this activates specific nociceptors via specific nociceptors and these generates action potential which fires up the primary afferent sensory neuron and then it fires on to interneuron and it fires on to spinothalamic projection neuron that is present in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord actually this neuron cross to the contralateral side of the spinal cord and ascends in the contralateral anterolateral white matter column up to the contralateral thalamus where these secondary neurons they synapse on to tertiary neurons right you know these tertiary neurons they carries this information to the different regions of your brain to make physical and emotional component of pain to make physical component of pain it carries this information to s1 which is nothing but primary somatosensory cortex and to make the emotional component of pain it carries this information to insula cortex and also some of the components of limbic system like cingulate cortex also the hippocampus regions and also these tertiary neurons they carries the information to hypothalamus structures right now let's talk about limbic system as i discussed earlier there are two structures of limbic system called hippocampus and cingulate cortex where both of these are involved in mounting the emotional component of pain right actually someone's initial emotional reaction to pain may be obvious they cry out they jump out they shrug it off you might think that this is an objective measurement of the severity of pain most of us would for example they cry out if he got burned or slap away a mosquito and move on with our day but as it turns out it's not that simple an individual's prior painful experiences can actually affect the perception of pain let me take one very common example how do you feel about the dentist how do you feel when i ask this question see if you have a strong healthy teeth and you have not had a very bad experiences with the dentist you probably just shrugged but if you have had a lot of work done maybe when i ask this question your heart beat just sped up a little if i think so right or your fingers clenched that little touch of fear that you just experienced can actually make even a routine dental cleansing feel more painful just because you are anticipating pain this is the first job of limbic system okay the second job of the limbic system is regulating the endocrine hormones and the autonomic nerves that means that pain signals received by the limbic system can ultimately affect your heart rate you are breathing as we just saw it may make you agitated tired dizzy or nauseated anxious or enraged but through controlling heart rate it also controls the flow of blood which sends pain suppressing chemicals and tissue repairing factors such as white blood cells and platelets to the site of injury helping initiating the healing process right a third essential function of the limbic system is forming memories all sorts of memories not just memories of pain but pain memories can be important they are how we learn that fire will burn us that thorns will prick us that knives can cut us and so forth and 
while those pain memories can do us some harm like making us anxious at the dentist overall they exist to keep us out of harm's way and our feelings and our memories of pain they interact with that third region of the brain i mentioned a little while ago called the frontal cortex especially this is where thinking and learning take place this is the part of you that knows you hate the dentist and it's also the same part of you that makes the dentist appointment in other words the way you think about pain controls how much pain you expect to feel in any given situation as well as what you do about it in this way your frontal cortex can rise or it can lowers your response to pain these and many more unique features of your physiology and personality from your attention span to your overall health to your cultural attitudes can affect the way your brain processes pain it's an incredibly complicated and individual process so i'm not being facetious or dismiss you when i say that pain really is in your head there's no way to disentangle the tissue damage that causes pain from your brain's experience of it right but i bet if you are living with pain or experience severe pain it's an experience you feel you could have lived without unfortunately that's not true pain at least acute pain it is essential to survival we need acute pain but how do we know this see at the start of this lecture i said that everyone experiences pain actually that's not quite true i once had the opportunity to study a young man in his 20s who was diagnosed with a congenital idiopathic inability to pursue pain this means he was unable to feel pain as most of us do a glance at this young man's history of injuries reveals the very real problems of a life saved without pain in one particularly vivid example his hand was slammed in a car door breaking numerous bones but neither he nor anyone else in his family noticed for hours the bones in his hands are now crooked because of that he had many more injuries like that over the years all because he did not know that he was hurt so acute pain's main function is to alert us to injury and get us to do something about it chronic pain is typically defined as persistent pain lasting for 3 months or longer unlike acute pain which usually has a very obvious cause chronic pain's cause may or may not be obvious it can result from ongoing tissue damage or it can persist even after an injury or illness that has actually triggered the pain has healed so even after healing you are going to see this pain and it can occur in the absence of any evidence of illness or injury it makes sense that ongoing damage would cause pain but what about the later two causes why does a person still experience pain once the damage is healed and in other case when there is no damage in the first place how this person is experiencing pain and this has long been one of the greatest mysteries of neuroscience for far too long people who complained of pain that had no apparent cause they were called as hypochondriacs or attention seekers however we now know this is not the case this type of chronic pain is absolutely real maybe you or someone you know has undergone and mri magnetic resonance imaging mri uses the magnetic properties of the human body in combination with radio waves to excite the hydrogen atoms within the body see different tissues have different hydrogen content and their response to these waves at different frequencies a computer then interprets these frequencies into a series of images each one showing a thin slice of the body mri images have helped us see how experiences changes our brains in all sorts of ways take for example 
a concert pianist hours and hours of practice every day leads not only to greater physical skill but to greater mental skill after all it's a part of the brain that somatosensory cortex that hears the music and another part the motor cortex that controls the movement of pianist fingers in time the pianist brain becomes hardwired to play a particular song and we can see those changes and we can see those hard wiring makes in this musician's brain on certain types of mri scans and neurologist actually terms this phenomenon as neuroplasticity right as with practice for years the individual is having the hard wiring in his brain even this is the same case that happens in pain in pain studies we can see structural differences between the brains of pain free subjects and patients with particular types of chronic pain it does not matter whether you can attribute this pain to tissue damage or not the brain changes are real something is hardwired in the patient's brain that is causing for pain in some cases chronic pain results from damage that lingers from an injury infection or even a surgery that's already healed we call this type of chronic pain as a neuropathic pain let me talk about neuropathic pain there are two general types of neuropathic pain this peripheral neuropathy and centrally mediated pain you can probably guess by now peripheral neuropathy indicates damage within the peripheral nervous system and centrally mediated neuropathic pain indicates damage within the central nervous system which is nothing but the brain or the spinal cord one of the most common forms of neuropathic pain is diabetic peripheral neuropathy over time high blood sugar in these patients is going to result in nerve damage most often to nociceptors in the feet and legs and patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy will often feel numbness tingling or burning sensation in their limbs and this seems even worse at night time right they can experience cramping as well or an increased sensitivity to touch clothing and bed sheets can be excruciatingly painful and we call this as allodynia their strength and reflexes diminish as does their balance and coordination and just like young man with congenital analgesia this hyperalgesia this increased sensitivity to pain is going to prevent the patient from recognizing when real damage is actually occurring and this is going to result in infections and other damage see why does this happen well currently this is still an open area of research we do know that when a nerve is physically cut the severed end can sprout a tangle of disorganized nerve fibers called a neuroma right and these neuromas they do not play by the usual roles they send signals spontaneously and they don't follow the usual checks and balances of the gating system neuromas or something uh, very like them could be one of the reason for the false pain signals and disorders like neuropathy diabetic neuropathy but if there is no known neurological damage then what well one theory is these patients are experiencing a disorder called central sensitization central sensitization like most of the processes we have been discussing is a fairly complex biological process but we can visualize it with a pretty straightforward analogy when pain signals are transmitted from injury or disease tissue other nerves can be activated or sensitized by the signal it's a lot like turning up the volume on your stereo if it's loud enough then the floor will shake the walls will shake the furniture and the sound will even start to distort somehow in these patients the volume has been turned up on their pain causing more neural circuits to send pain signals one of the best examples of central sensitization is phantom limb syndrome 
in which a person can feel intense pain in a body part that is no longer there right central sensitization can affect more than just the nociceptors it can turn up the volume on all your senses making all kinds of sensations very difficult to tolerate and here patients with what we call central sensitization can be extremely sensitive to smells to lights and to sounds they can have sensitive digestive systems they are often exhausted because everything they experience is simply overwhelming right the exact mechanism that causes sensitization is not yet understood but a great deal of research has been devoted to finding both the cause and appropriate treatments for this kind of pain and we believe that understanding sensitization will help us better understand and better treat all types of pain so my dear friends this is the end of my lecture on pain and in the next lecture we are going to talk about the treatment of pain so stay tuned guys we meet in the next lecture with a new concept till then stay tuned have a nice day